Well, sometimes the desire to run for Parliament can get heated. A brawl broke out last night at a Liberal nomination meeting in Toronto. Not the kind of competitiveness any party wants, but an indication we're getting close to the election. Just over a year away now, and all parties are on the lookout for great candidates. That's our topic tonight. Jamie and Kathleen are here in Toronto. David is in San Francisco. First, here's an update on where the parties stand. Remember, this time there are 338 ridings up for grabs. That's 30 more than last time. And right now, you see the Conservatives are saying they have more than 100 candidates nominated. They haven't given a specific number, but they say it's more than 100. The Liberals at 98, the NDP at 24, the Green Party at 6. A year out, are those numbers what one would expect? Is that good? Is it bad? Does it mean anything? Let's start with somebody wearing pink. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I don't really think it means much this, this, this many months out from the actual election. I mean, I've sat in war rooms, you know, when the writ had already been dropped and people were out campaigning and we were still searching for candidates. So it doesn't mean a lot. I think that if you want a democratic process, I think if you want a transparent process, a process that really engages the grassroots, that takes time. And I don't think Canadians want to see appointments by leaders. They want to see a really engaged process, and so it does take time. Are there dangers in nominating too many too early? Yeah, I, I think there. I don't. Th I think it's instructive that two parties are at about a hundred, and one party isn't. Um, so I, I think you want to get two on. Two parties aren't. Sorry. Two parties aren't. Or hundred. Um, there is the Greens are there. Oh, I'm sorry. Right. Um, I think you want to get on with the process, and uh, so this, especially now, year out, I think you're going to see it heating up. Uh, the problem with getting it done too soon, of course, is that you might change your mind or someone else might come that's along. Right. And I think that's why parties have traditionally wanted to wait a bit of time to make sure they get the best possible candidate. And, of course, once you're nominated, that has implications on your life. So you may have to resign your job or you may have restrictions on your job. Mm -hmm. So getting nominated is actually a big commitment. It affects a lot of other things. And so for that reason, people might be waiting as well. All right, David, on the numbers so far, do they mean anything one way or the other to you? Well, I don't, I don't think it tells us anything about the relative strength of any of the parties, <clears throat> but it, it may tell us something about the organizational preparedness um, of the parties. I, I think, uh, while agreeing with what um, my, much of my two colleagues have said, I think there is an advantage to going early, and I think there's two advantages to it. First of all, you give your candidates more time to actually get out there and start campaigning in the general public and getting their name known and, uh, and starting to identify people that will support them. The second thing is that uh, the recruitment of candidates and the nomination of candidates is one of the best ways that parties recruit volunteers. Most volunteers get involved in a party around a candidate or around a specific person. So for example, the Liberal Party in those 100 nominations has signed up over 100,000 members. Uh, just on the basis of those nomination meetings alone. So it's quite a strong organizational advantage, and there's uh, not much reason at this point to be waiting, I don't think. Well, right. and Peter, there's another big advantage, which is the money that that nominated candidate spends is not subject to any spending limitations. Right. Right so right mm -hmm. now, especially if you don't have a big profile you, and, you, and you're capable of raising the money, which a lot of people are, you can be spending money in your riding, building a profile, and you'll only become subject to the limit when the writ is dropped. And that's when the election campaign actually starts. starts. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's get to the, the, the crux of this matter, which is how do you actually find people who want to run for you? How difficult is that, Kathleen? Well, it is difficult, and, and it depends. Each party has their own kind of characteristics they look for. Some parties look for stars, other par uh, like national stars. Other parties look for local stars, people who can bring on volunteer teams, as David pointed out. Um, but it's a bit of a courting process. It's a bit of it's a bit like dating, if you will, trying to find a, a candidate. And you know, there are dinners involved, conversations, lots of phone calls. Many people are involved, from local organizers to MPs to other state to up to the leader to try to encourage people to vote. But just like dating, sometimes there's often a little bit of embellishment and uh, you might try to impress. And so, for instance, I do a lot of recruitment of women candidates trying to get women involved in politics. And I don't lead, for instance, with, hey, if you get into politics, you might not get to your kid's recital or you might miss a few doctor's appointments. No, I say how important it is for women to be involved in public policy and that's why they should uh, should join the team. So there is a bit of embellishment, and uh, but, you know, it's a... An, an important job and public service is important. I guess, David, you got to prioritize too, right? I mean, we've got 338 ridings. You're not going to win them all. 
but you must have to be focusing on the areas where you think you can run before you decide on <clears throat> where you really need to get good, strong candidates. There's a lot of considerations that go into this, Peter. You, you've identified a couple of them right there. And I, I think to start with, there's a um, just a, a factual matter that needs to be understood. What, this is often understood as purely a local phenomenon, and, and when it's not a purely local phenomenon, when the central party gets involved in a nomination, often that's controversial and people are critical. But people need to understand that while the uh, members are, but while the candidates are chosen locally, generally, and while that's, they are running in a local constituency, the leader of the party has to sign the papers of every candidate. Um, and so therefore, the leader of the party takes ownership over all of the candidates. That's why, for example, the parties all have various versions of what the Liberal Party calls a green light committee, which is that all people who want to seek a nomination have to be actually approved to seek a nomination. And you do things like criminal background checks and uh, previously stated positions on issues and get to understand exactly whether this person is a legitimate candidate for your party or not and whether you want the leader standing beside that candidate. But there's a lot of strategic implications as well. For example, par a new leader will often want to show renewal and change within the party and want to recruit new people that the public understands to be new. For example, that's why um, uh, when I was working with Mr. Martin in British Columbia, we really wanted to make a big splash in British Columbia. So we recruited people like David Emerson and Ujel Dosage and David Haggard, a major union leader in British Columbia, to create the public impression that this was a different Liberal Party and it had gone through renewal. So it's not, it's not purely a matter of leaving it to the local association to decide. There are other considerations. How did that Emerson uh, nomination work out for you? <laughs> yeah, <exactly. laughs> yeah, well, you know, some people are interested in politics and other people are interested in exercising power. But, <laughs> but, you know, the Emerson is a good example, really, Peter. First of all, we have to think about how much this matters. And you know, David's the pollster, but generally speaking, the maximum advantage you're going to get from an individual candidate is about 6%. Now, 6% can make the difference between winning and losing, but these things are still decided by the leader, by the party party, by the national campaign, not by the candidate in a particular electoral district. But, you know, when you do have candidates, there's sort of three kinds of candidates. Those who grow up in the, in the system and are part of your party and are really part of your traditions, they're pretty good and pretty predictable. But then there's the other two kinds, the kind that you go and seek out and the kind that seek you out. And those ones generally don't have deep roots in the party. They don't really understand what it means to be subject to the discipline of the whip in the caucus, uh, that it's a team player, that they're that their, uh, their wings will be clipped. And so you get people who aren't overly partisan, who decide they want to go into public life. And for a lot of these people, the day before they were recruited and their candidacy was announced, people in their community, would, could, half of them would say they were one partisanship and half would say they were another. And the stickiness of that sometimes is a problem when you get into the rough and tumble of politics. You... They bring, of course, name recognition and credentials, but they also bring some weaknesses too. How involved does the leader get? I hear what you're, you're all saying about uh, obviously the leader's got to be comfortable uh, with whoever these candidates are, but in terms of the recruitment process, how often you put the actual leader on the phone or arrange a meeting with these people, say, look, you know, you've got to run for us. Uh, how often does that happen? It, in a minority parliament, Jack Layton was on the phone very often. There was a percentage of his week that was booked um, in that was for candidate search. Would meet with candidates, potential candidates, all the time, going to conventions and events, trying to find new people. Um, you know, for instance, a MP in the House, Romeo Saganash, he met with multiple times over um, a number of years in order to secure Romeo, who is a uh, very important Are leader. Are promises being made in those conversations no. about how they will be played if they win? No, but listen, back to the metaphor of dating. Uh, what, mm. the, this is what this recruitment really is. It's like you're kind of waiting to see who's going to say I love you first. And when you have a big candidate, somebody like Romeo Saganash, who's a leader uh, mm. in the Cree Nation, and um, you know, you want to ensure, uh, Romeo, from his perspective, would want to ensure that the party's truly behind him and will support him in his run. So there are things like, for instance, a fully financed campaign or a strong campaign manager. These are the levers that a leader has to ensure, to secure a candidacy. Um, there aren't other promises made, but things like making sure you get a really strong campaign manager. But th and, but there are also the opportunities for, for somebody to say, hey, 
cabinet position. Yeah, no, I've no, never no, known no. of a leader ever to no. have said that. No. Uh, people may imply that on their behalf. We have no business doing. The one thing I don't think you'd put a prime... I think it depends where you are in the leadership uh, cycle, but I don't think you'd put a prime minister on the phone to talk to a candidate who's going to say no. I think you, you better be pretty bloody sure that candidate is going to say... that she's going to say yes before you put the prime minister on the phone to close it. And I've never heard of anybody getting a promise. It's just crazy to do that because you don't know what you're going to end up with and how on earth can you make a choice uh, until you know what you're choosing from. David, on that point, how well, far the leader goes? Well, on the goes? latter point, my experience is a little different. On the first point, I completely agree with what Jamie uh, just said, which was my attitude was always the leader is a closer. Uh, of the deal. You wouldn't get the leader involved in conversations uh, where they had to get into the negotiations uh, or uh, might face a possible no. You want that conversation. When you get the leader involved, you want that conversation to be successful. But in the process of recruiting, quotes star candidates, um, it's unusual in my experience for considerations like what riding will I run in? What will the nomination process be like? Will I have to go through a nomination process? What might my role be in the government should we be successful in winning the election? Uh, people are interested in all of those things, and it's not surprising to me that they're interested in those things. Most of these people are actually giving up a fair bit or putting a fair bit at risk uh, to run. They're likely making a financial sacrifice to run. They're likely putting their status in the community at some risk should they lose. Um, and so they have, um, and there's tremendous family costs, as Kathleen alluded to mm -hmm. earlier. So th they're giving up a fair bit. Listen, good insight, as we expect from the insiders. David's in San Francisco today, lucky guy, and Kathleen and Jamie are here in Toronto.